Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for our quarterly Corruption Prevention and Integrity Insights Forum. I'm Linda Timothy, Executive Director Prevention and Communication at IPAC and I'm really pleased today to be facilitating this event. To begin today's event, I'd like to acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional custodians of the land that we are broadcasting from. I'm on the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I pay respect to their elders past and present and to any Aboriginal people joining us today. I also respectfully acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands and waterways across Victoria and pay respect to elders past, present and emerging. I'm delighted that so many of you could join us today. We've received over 450 registrations for this webinar um, from agencies right across all parts of metropolitan and regional Victoria, and we welcome a large cohort from interstate as well. And a special welcome to those of you joining from our partner agencies within the Victorian Integrity System, as well as our interstate counterparts. Thanks all of you for joining us. Today's forum is about big projects and big risks. We're looking at corruption risks in major infrastructure projects and some ways to prevent and manage those risks. Victorian major infrastructure projects make up a complex sector that receives billions of taxpayer dollars each year. The 2022-23 Victorian state budget committed $3.5 billion to public transport services and infrastructure. These major projects face significant pressure to complete construction and provide essential buildings and services for Victorians. And last month, IBAC released a research report into corruption risks associated with major transport infrastructure projects. In developing this report, we worked closely with the Major Transport Infrastructure Authority to identify corruption risks, as well as identify remedies and controls to help prevent corruption. What we learned can be applied beyond the transport sector, and there are valuable insights for anyone looking to prevent corruption in major projects. So we hope that today's forum will offer all of you some practical strategies to identify corruption risks in your own projects, to strengthen your existing systems and mitigate corruption risks to deliver projects with integrity. And today we're joined by speakers from both IBAC and the MTIA, who will share their insights from our research report, as well as practical strategies to prevent corruption. Our speakers today are Dan Ong, Senior Strategic Intelligence Analyst from IBAC and the author of our research report. And from the MTIA, Sarah McIver, Director of Program Governance and Assurance, Josh Miller, General Counsel, Tom McAvaney, Director, Commercial Legal and Governance at Rail Projects Victoria. Thanks to all of you for taking the time to be with us here today. But just a couple of things before I hand over to our first speaker, a few housekeeping matters. If you would like to turn on live captions on, you can do so by clicking on captions in the meeting controls at the bottom of your desktop, or if you're using a mobile device, by clicking on settings in the Zoom app, then tapping meeting to turn on the captions. <clears throat> you can turn on the Auslan interpreter by clicking in the interpretation button at the bottom of the Zoom screen as well. And if you're experiencing any technical difficulties, please first check that you've downloaded the latest version of Zoom. Now there will be an opportunity to ask questions during an audience Q&A session in the second half of this webinar. So if you could please submit any questions and comments you have throughout today's event by using the Q&A function, which you'll also see at the bottom of your screen. And as this webinar will last for approximately one hour, we will continue the conversation after the event by sending any relevant resources and answering any of the questions we weren't able to get to today. And just a reminder, please be aware that we're not able to answer any questions about ongoing investigations. And lastly, 
A recording of this webinar will be made available on the IBAC website in the coming weeks and we'll also share the presentation slides. So now, just before I hand over to our first speaker, I'd like to play a video summary of our research report. IBEC has released a research report on the corruption risks that impact major Victorian infrastructure projects during procurement and construction. In Victoria, major infrastructure projects make up a growing sector that receives billions of taxpayer dollars each year. It's also a sector where the impacts of corruption are higher due to the size, the complexity and the amount of money involved. IBEC's research focused on projects overseen by the major transport infrastructure authority. These projects are being undertaken through the Victorian government's multi-billion dollar Big Build initiative. Importantly, the report provides strategies on how organisations can detect and reduce the risk of corruption occurring. IBEX research found that the key corruption risks impacting major transport infrastructure projects during procurement and construction are fraud, collusion and bribery during procurement, Collusion and bribery by contractors and subcontractors. Contractor and subcontractor fraud, such as false invoicing and false claims. And favoritism and fraudulent recruitment practices, including payroll fraud. Significantly, our research also identified key corruption drivers in the sector. These are complex systems and processes and operating environments, high level political performance and economic pressures to deliver, and conflicts of interest resulting from a small number of major contractors and a shortage of technical experts. The Victorian community expects major infrastructure projects to have a high standard of integrity and to ensure that public funds are managed appropriately and that the risks of corruption are minimised. Here are a few prevention tips for people responsible for major infrastructure projects to consider. Corruption prevention starts with strong integrity frameworks and corruption controls. Ensure you have centralised and coordinated risk assessment, detection and prevention measures, and data collection and analysis between projects. Share information between integrity officers and those who are responsible for leadership and governance to strengthen integrity frameworks and corruption controls. Consider using contract management frameworks, such as alliance contracting, to increase transparency. Develop and uphold a culture of integrity and an awareness of the public sector standards among construction suppliers and across projects. And mandate minimum contracting clauses that protect the public sector from corrupt practices and that drive and support ethical practices. IBAC will continue to work with organisations across the public sector to raise awareness of the risks highlighted in this report. I encourage anyone involved in delivering high value, high risk projects to visit our website and to read the research report in full. Well, I hope that was a useful introduction to the research report. And now, without any further ado, I'm delighted to introduce our first speaker, Dan Ong, to provide us with some more detail about the insights the research provided. Dan works in our strategic intelligence team and he led the development of the research report. Over to you, Dan, and welcome. Thanks, Linda, and thanks everyone for joining us today. I just want to start with um, highlighting the fact that I am but one author of this project and uh, one part of this large organisation uh, that has not only an investigative function but a preventative function. And just to highlight some of that, we obviously have to keep some things secret in terms of the sources, the protecting the investigation, the integrity, and to increase the chances of the investigation success in court. But we're also very open and very collaborative, and this whole report has actually been the product of some great engagement with the MTO, the AA that we'll hear from later. Part of our role in strategic intelligence is to examine the trends that we can observe in data and to try and look as far as we can beyond the horizon in terms of what might be the risks and drivers to come. So we've highlighted major infrastructure projects as part of our strategic focus, as you can see. 
Sorry about that. We've got six of those, and um, one of those was major infrastructure projects. So why was this an area of interest? Well, obviously, everyone knows about the large amount of public money that's being spent in infrastructure projects. We're dealing with very complex systems within the MTIA. And importantly, it's a very close collaboration between the public and private sectors with a large amount of people coming from the private sector to work in the public sector and vice versa. We've also got a lot of stri different strings involved in terms of funding between state and federal um, departments. So basically what led to this report was engagement from the executive of the MTIA, which we really appreciate from the CEO down. It's been a really good example of uh, top-down leadership. We consulted with the project officers and the execs involved in those projects. And we collaboratively put together a workshop to discuss some of those issues in more detail. And that's been ongoing. We've, we've had a lot of to and fro between the, the MTA, which I'd really like to highlight as an example of the collaboration that we can partake in uh, as IBAC with departments and agencies in the BPS. What we've observed, and this is a really quick snapshot of the cases involved in the sector, is 26 cases. Not all have been substantiated, but they've highlighted some allegations. And as you can see there, a lot of them are related to favoritism, as well as inaction uh, and breach of professional boundaries. And the latter two relate to uh, managers and public sector uh, employees who are not doing enough to investigate complaints and allegations within their own purview or exceeding the professional boundaries that, that they've been entrusted with. Uh, primary behaviours, apart from that, uh, we can see that there's misuse of resources and collusion and bribery. None of this will be surprising to many of you who work in the integrity sector. I won't read out what's been already highlighted by our Assistant Commissioner. Uh, we've obviously got some very familiar risks there that have been highlighted in our previous reports. Um, perhaps one thing that I would highlight is the contractor and subcontractor fraud. One of the things that we really um, highlighted in the report was that there are tiers of contractors uh, that you know, cascade down to tier three, tier four in some cases. What doesn't diminish, we want to emphasise, is the responsibility to the public. Uh, and that's the supply code of conduct. You might have a primary contractor, but as you go down the list, that responsibility to be transparent and to work collaboratively with the public sector to make sure that the public interest is being served does not diminish. Um, so that's something that we'd really like to highlight that the MTA has done, that they've onboarded people from the private sector and, and uh, underlined that importance of public service. Oops. Going back, we look at the drivers, and again, I won't um, labour the point by reading them verbatim, but what I could emphasise perhaps is the high level of political influence that we're aware of. We didn't focus on every aspect of project um, infrastructure projects. We focused specifically on delivery, but we are alive to the risks that are evident in the sort of boundaries between planning and delivery. And, and IBAC has spoken at length um, regarding the influence, undue influence, I should say, on projects of these, um, these, these sizes and the conflicts of interest that can result, of course, between the number of contractors that we have and the, the uh, transfer of people from both sectors. When we talk about corruption detection and prevention strategies, I think, again, a lot of you would be familiar with what we've highlighted in previous reports. Um, I'd like to highlight the integrity framework reviews that IBAC has done in both 2015 and 2019 most recently, uh, the first three, and no surprise, um, in fact, all of them, we have to keep on emphasising the fact that these drivers and risks uh, keep on evolving, but the main themes don't really. Um, we just need to hammer home the point that we need to all collectively do this very well. What I would like to highlight perhaps is the culture of integrity and awareness. Uh, what I'll allude to later is the fact that we, in many instances, don't have a culture that makes people safe or aware of integrity standards. Again, I think the MTI has quite a few good instances of how they educate their workforce, both 
from the public uh, private sector as well as the public sector about those um, requirements. And in terms of like mandating minimum contracting clauses, I think that's a really important point that we need to float the whole bunch of boats here and not just the public sector. We have a, an amazing opportunity to influence the standards and the behaviours that are evident in the private sector, knowing that many of those people will come and join us in the public sector afterwards. Red flags of corruption. Again, uh, we published a recent red flags publication that you can refer to to get some more detail about this. Um, interestingly, we consulted with our ICAC New South Wales colleagues. Uh, you can follow the proceedings of Operation Hector, which has revealed uh, collusion and other behaviours between public sector servants, uh, public servants and contractors. So that's something, individual behaviour like that, undeclared interests, close relationships with contractors, we keep seeing that again and again. And I would say don't wait for the red flags to come up. There are certainly new misses, amber flags that are raised all the time and it's our responsibility to be aware of those and to communicate those with our colleagues. In terms of perceptions of corruption, I'd also like to plug our recent perceptions of corruption report that we put out recently. And one interesting and concerning um, stat from that is that among suppliers, there is still a concerning percentage that are not prepared to speak up about instances of corruption and fraud that they have observed. And that's a concerning fact because without a very safe, responsive and reporting culture, we'll continue to see that lack of engagement and we won't have the data that we need to analyse the trends and risks that concern us all. So I'd underline that fact that it's really developing a, a public sector culture that is um, welcoming of those reports by whistleblowers that we would rely on. And to finish off, I'd say that information sharing is fundamental. This is a really good case of sharing what's been a good practice by the MTIA. It's a bit of show and tell from them to follow. And I'd say that the resources that we put out are all there for you in terms of the, uh, the red flags that we have outlined, but it's up to us collectively as the public sector to take those red flags and to add some context and detail, put it in your training, make it really contextual and relevant to newcomers and, and old hands alike. So without further ado, I'll pass back to Linda and, to, and look forward to hearing from the MTIA. Thanks, Linda. Thanks, Dan. Some really important context and some interesting pointers as to where to find more information. Um, so we've seen questions coming in, um, but please remember to keep submitting any questions you have for all of our speakers, and we'll get to those after um, our next presentations from the MTIA. And so I would now like to introduce Sarah McIver, Tom McAvaney, and Josh Miller from the Major Transport Infrastructure Authority. They will provide some practical context um, for our discussions today by sharing information about the MTIA's governance and integrity frameworks. Sarah joined the MTIA nearly four years ago with over 25 years working in assurance, risk, compliance, and governance across the public sector and private sector. She leads the program assurance team at the MTIA with responsibility for the key assurance activities, including risk, audit, and integrity. Tom McAvaney is the director, commercial, legal, and governance at Real Projects Victoria. Tom joined Real Projects Victoria four years ago with a background of nearly 20 years working in major projects and infrastructure. He leads the legal, commercial and governance teams supporting the development, procurement and delivery of the Metro Tunnel Project, Melbourne Airport Rail and Regional Rail Revival Programme as part of the Big Build. Josh Miller has been a practising lawyer for over 20 years with his career spanning both the public and private sectors. He has worked widely across the transport portfolio including at the Department of Transport, Public Transport Victoria, and now at the MTIA, where he's the General Counsel. So welcome, Sarah, Tom and Josh, and over to you. Uh, thanks, Linda, for those introductions, um, and thank you for asking us to be part of the webinar. Um, I'd like to talk to you first about the governance framework 
Uh, sorry. The governance framework at MTA to support our program and particular focus on the integrity framework. Josh and Tom will talk about our construction contracts and our governance and assurance around our procurement. And they'll also provide some perspectives on the different um, project delivery models that MTIA currently use. I probably thought it'd be worth just giving you a little bit of an overview of the big build, as we call ourselves. Um, it is the biggest sort of project, uh, transport project um, in Victoria's history. We've currently got about 165 projects. Um, the estimated spend over the life of the big build is 90 billion. Um, to date, and it's probably gone up since this slide was done, 190 million hours worked, which is um, very, very um, satisfying for us. And in 2022, our expenditure was around 9 billion. Just give you a bit of an overview on the governance structure. Um, our minister, as you would probably realize, is Minister Allen. Um, we are an administrative office um, of the Department of Transport and Planning. And our sort of uh, leadership is the director general with four CEOs of the four project offices listed below on the slide. Probably worth giving a little bit of overview on the projects. Rail Projects Victoria is um, the major rail projects for the tunnel, the Metro Tunnel, Melbourne Airport Rail, and also Regional Rail Link. The Level Crossing Removal Project is um, the project office that's running the removal of the 100 plus level crossings. Major Roads Projects Victoria now includes the Westgate Tunnel Project, so that leads um, the Large Roads Projects. And then last but not least, the North East Link Project, which is the largest project that we're currently running, which is obviously the tunnels and the roads to join the North East with the, the rest of Melbourne. In terms of our program assurance environment, um, this is led out of the Office of the Director General. So we have a program assurance group, which um, has an internal audit function, the strategic risk function and the integrity function. The oversight of that is by a program assurance uh, risk and integrity committee, which is made up of independent members from MTIA. In addition, we are very keen on sharing learnings and sharing information across the MTIA. So there are what we, we have what are called communities of practice, we have an assurance community of practice and a risk community of practice, which very much focus on um, working with the management teams at the project office to ensure that we all understand what issues are occurring and how we're managing them at an MTIA program level. The integrity framework, which we'll focus on now, um, we, we, we sort of came up with um, the three key sort of goals of our framework. No, and that's about the staff understanding their obligations, complying with their obligations and complying with all relevant um, policies and procedures. Avoid, so putting their private interests, avoid putting their private interests before the public interests. Um, in Dan's presentation, he mentioned um, conflict of interest, so that's a very important focus for us in our integrity framework. And then report, and again, sort of leveraging from what Dan said, obviously we put a strong emphasis on our staff reporting um, breaches as part of our anti-corruption stance. The key elements of the framework, um, the culture, this is obviously very important to us and I think it's very important to emphasise the tone from the top. Our Director General and our CEOs have um, delivered an integrity leadership statement with a strong focus on sort of reminding our staff of obligations and ensuring they understand that integrity is at the heart of what MTIA does. And that also aligns with the VPS code of conduct and sort of the public sector values. Um, training, we, oh, apologies. Training. We have spent a lot of time over the past few years developing some quite comprehensive integrity training. All staff, regardless of level, are required to complete that. There's an induction program which includes that as well. And we also strongly emphasize annual refresher trainings. The other thing about the training is we have a strong emphasis on monitoring compliance with the training and ensuring that staff have completed the training on a timely basis. Um, within any organization, your policies and procedures are fundamental. Some of the key ones that we consider very important from an integrity lens are our conflict of interest policy, our declaration of private interest processes, confidentiality agreements, um, gifts, benefits and hospitality declarations, um, and relevant HR policies such as um, outside employment approval, misconduct, and a very strong emphasis on employment pre-screening as part of our recruitment process. Um, the tools and registers that we have, um, we have our integrity hotline, so we have a third party hotline that anyone can make a, a, a declaration to. It can be anonymous, it can be, um, people can be um, identified, it's really up to their choice. We monitor that on a regular basis and obviously we have a strong follow-up process. 
We have online registers for um, gifts, benefits, and hospitalities for declaration of private interests, and we have for conflict of interest. That ensures that we can look across the program and sort of identify any potential issues as they arrive. Um, we also have investigator, investigators that we can utilize at any stage when an incident may occur, and that's very important so we can get them on the grind and get sort of any investigation that may be required going as quickly as possible. And the other thing that we've developed is we've developed some data analytics programs, particularly around some suspicious transactions, um, looking at vendor master files, looking at employee bank accounts, etc. So that's an important part of our sort of um, process to sort of identify any issues that may occur as, sort of as promptly as possible. It, the other, the final thing I'll talk about is our actual fraud and corruption control framework, um, and we sort of highlighted the key things within that: um, roles, responsibilities, um, the risk management process, and again, that was mentioned, I think, by the commissioner in his presentation. How important it is to be constantly aware of where the risks are arising, um, identifying them, assessing them, and then developing sort of mitigations to try and manage the risks. The prevention piece, we've talked a lot about our framework and that's very much focused on prevention. It's talking about the leadership, our training, our policies and procedures, um, conflicts of interest and, and all of those areas. I think that's really important. The detection, um, the hotline, our data analytics program, our audits. Um, you know, our audit focuses very much on the core risks. For example, we look at information security audits, we look at procurement audits, contract management. Um, so those are very important in terms of a detection piece. And then the final point is the response. Um, so, you know, we, we're very conscious that you need to respond quickly. And, you know, if there is any instance, we triage them, we work up the level of investigation, invest, investigation that's required, and we respond very, very fast to that as part of our sort of um, oversight process. So that's a very quick summary of the MTI integrity framework. Um, and I'll happily now pass over to Josh. Thanks very much, Sarah, and thanks, Linda and Dan, for the introductions. Uh, what we'd like to do next is um, just to provide a bridge between the MTIA integrity framework, which Sarah has um, very well described, um, and between uh, and getting to then how does that apply on the ground? What does that mean in terms of our procurement and our project delivery approaches? Um, and as Sarah described, there's elements of the framework that apply both internally, that is to our staff, but it's important to note but they also translate into approaches with our external parties as well, particularly our construction contractors. And, and I'd like to highlight there the importance of culture that we've described, which we'll talk more about today, um, but the importance of setting the culture, cultural settings right and getting that tone right at the outset, because that has a very pervasive impact across um, the spectrum of parties who are involved in delivery of our projects. Um, so this slide is really just to set some context and to provide a brief rundown of the types of contracts that we engage with across MTIA. Um, the key take out point I think is that there are many different forms of contract that we use. Contract models selected um, based on the nature of the project and the complexities and the risk profile that are um, that, that best suit the project to be delivered. But just briefly from left to right, um, our managing contractor model is used a lot for early works processes such as utilities relocations um, and site preparation activities at the front end of a project before the major works packages um, kick off. Design and construct contracts um, are used, um, uh, we, we tend to use more collaborative forms of contracts um, more so than design and construct which are these days which um, design and construct contracts are very much a, um, a risk transfer um, type of contract, as most people are probably aware, um, where the risk of delivery of the project is by and large transferred to the private sector um, for a fixed price. Our program delivery approach is an approach that we've developed for delivery of our major road projects uh, through Major Road Projects Victoria. And that involves a form of contract known as an incentivised target cost contract. So essentially a target cost is set for delivery of the project with our contractor um, being incentivised um, to perform well. Um, and that those incentives relate to both performance in relation to cost, but also non-cost elements as well. For example, um, excellent safety and environmental performance. Alliance contracts are used broadly um, across the rail sector in particular. We find them very useful in a brownfield environment where there's many complexities and unknowns associated with delivery of the project that need to be collaboratively developed between the state 
um, and the contractor. Um, so a core feature of, the, of this contract model is collaboration between the private sector and the state. Um, and again, we use target costs for our alliance contracts with incentives for the contractor to perform um, and to come under that target cost um, and also to perform uh, in relation to those non-cost elements as well that I mentioned, such as safety and environmental performance. Uh, and finally, public-private partnership contracts. These are, um, as you can see on the slide, they're used for some of our larger um, uh, contracts and packages of work. Um, this involves the creation of a special purpose vehicle between the state and the DNC, typically a DNC subcontractor, um, which provides an interface between the state and delivery on the ground. So a lot of different forms of contract, as I say, used um, depending on the, the specifics of the projects with which we're involved. Um, I wanted to touch upon um, the next slide, which was around the governance and assurance frameworks for procurement that, we've, that we uh, engage. And the main point in, in relation to this is that there are notwithstanding a multitude of different contract forms and contract models in play, um, they are all supported by extremely robust governance and assurance frameworks. These frameworks not only support the procurement and engagement of our contractors to deliver the works, but also importantly, the ongoing delivery of, of the projects as well, once the contracts are signed. So to call out some of the key features uh, of these frameworks, um, we have an MTIA procurement framework, which sets the rules and roles and responsibilities um, around uh, procurement for our contracts. There's ministerial directions which exist, um, which apply across the whole of Victorian government, which do um, entail um, concepts of integrity within them as well. DTF led high value, high risk framework. Um, these, impo these impose um, specific um, and more tailored arrangements in relation to project assurance. And they're supplemented by a gateway review process as well, which makes sure that at certain stages across the project life cycle, um, that there are independent um, parties who come in to assure that the project is ready to progress to the next stage. Internally, we have multi-layered um, teams um, involving oversight of, our, of the procurement of our projects. So we've got evaluation teams who will review the bids when they come in. Um, they are then supported by executive review teams who will review the evaluation team's work um, and plenty of involvement through our central agency and Department of Transport and Planning colleagues as well. Um, very rigorous uh, processes apply in relation to evaluation, including in relation to pricing, scheduling, value for money. Um, these are supported by both our internal teams and our external advisors. Um, and finally, and really importantly for the purposes of the discussion today, um, we have very heavy involvement from probity advisors and also probity auditors in relation to um, the processes which we run internally to reach our procurement outcomes. Um, and they typically involve a sign off at the end of the process to confirm that there's no um, probity or integrity issues that have been uh, discovered throughout that procurement process. Now I'd like to pass on to Tom. Um, to talk about some of the more on-the-ground observations based on um, our experiences at MTIA in relation to what we've been speaking about. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Josh. <clears throat> so I, I guess rounding out with what does this mean for us in delivery? So um, we've got robust frameworks, we've got robust contracts, as we've heard. Probably, I guess, the point, though, is that what, 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 when the rubber hits the road, um, what's important are the people. So it's important that both the project leadership at the client, the, the, the project client being the state and our contractors, um, understand the frameworks, understand the contracts and lead from the top. So being accountable and aware of what we expect uh, from an integrity perspective. I guess really pleasingly, um, we've got a great relationship with our contractor set and that leadership is paramount um, and set from uh, from the Director General. So I guess we've really been lucky to see or fortunate to see that our, in practice, we get the results that we want from our contractors. When an issue does occur, we can, we can get that transparent reporting, that um, proactive issue management. I guess the other point I was going to make just on um, the different contract forms, we do have uh, multiple forms of contract in use um, and different contract models have different strengths, different benefits. Uh, probably we do see the need, particularly in the rail space, for the more collaborative contract models because they do a better job of managing the complex interfaces that we work, work in. 
and probably one of the benefits that they bring, and I think Stephen touched on it in his um, video, is the additional transparency that we get from the open book arrangements that those alliance models generally deliver. So we get um, top to bottom open book transparency on pricing and delivery um, progress and really gives us an extra opportunity to understand what's going on on the ground. But I guess irrespective of the model we use, and if, as I say, different contracts have different pros and, um, and, and some benefits, pr probably we would say all, all, all the models incentivize our contractors to manage the risks in delivery well um, when, when uh, they're set up to deliver a profitable outcome for the contractor. Uh, that means an efficient outcome in delivery and a um, close focus on managing all aspects of delivery. Um, so we see the benefit of embedding collaborative behaviours to implement um, our fraud and corruption prevention framework in, in practice. Um, and we've been, um, I, I guess, as, as, that, as those practices uh, develop, we've really been um, uh, we've really been fortunate to see that that, that that has landed with that strong leadership from our contractor cohort. Um, so that was about what we wanted to cover. Well, thank you. Thank you all again, Sarah, Tom and Josh. It's great to have some um, practical examples of what the MTA is doing to prevent corruption. Um, and a big thank you again. We're very grateful to the MTIA for your cooperation in developing our research report um, into the corruption risks in major tra in transport infrastructure. So now we've come to the Q&A part of the forum. Um, thanks to everybody who has submitted a question with their registration, but please do continue to submit questions via the Q&A function in the Zoom. And as I said before, we will try to answer as many as possible and keep our responses short. Um, there will be questions that unfortunately we won't get to, so we'll look out for follow-up responses in the coming weeks. Um, so I've got a few questions here, maybe to Dan um, first, or perhaps Dan and Sarah. Can you talk about how people can disclose corruption allegations and what happens to those? Sure. I would obviously, yeah, if I was an employee, obviously your, your PID coordinator is your first port of call. They have primary connections into your own organisation in terms of integrity and assurance, uh, and obviously we convene with them regularly in terms of helping them support their education function. Um, so yeah, I'd probably call on those. But as we well know, that the integrity system is wide, so there is no wrong door. Everything does come to us if it's uh, pertinent to our scope of um, serious and systemic corruption. So um, I'm going to add to that, Sarah, perhaps from an MTI's perspective. Look, we have our, as I said earlier, we've got the hotline and we do promote that quite strongly. Staff can come and talk to their senior management teams um, on any issues. And I and another, the Director of Integrity and myself are the PID, PID coordinators across MTIA. So there is there's certainly um, enough information out there to, for staff to know who and when they can go to with any allegations. Um, and I think the stop line has been a good addition to our toolkit in that respect. Mm, yeah, thank you. Um, so this one is about conflict of interest then. So what, uh, and one for Sarah, what kind of tools do you use for detecting conflict of interest in public procurement? And we've been asked specifically to use any AI, artificial intelligence. Um, look, I think, uh, as I said earlier, we do have some data analytics programs, which I'll talk about as well. But um, as Tom mentioned in his presentation, there is a strong, uh, and, and Josh as well, there is a strong focus on probity in all procurement processes. Um, as I said earlier, we've got a comp we've got strong conflict of interest declaration requirements. So anybody who's involved in any procurement has to do a conflict of interest um, at all stages along the procurement, whether it's the evaluation, et cetera, as well. Um, in addition, there's a probity advisor and also a probity auditor on the majority of our large construction contracts. In terms of the artificial intelligence, we do when we collect information on declarations of private interest and conflicts of interest, we can do some checking through um, employee bank accounts and whether, whether it aligns with any vendors in our system. We also look um, potentially with, into ASIC as to whether anybody's got some shareholdings or particular companies. So if there's any particular risk areas we've identified, we certainly have the tools to do that. And we have done that and we will continue to do that because I think as we've all agreed, um, the sort of integrity of the process, particularly around procurement, is very, very important to us at MTIA. Thanks, Sarah. 
And we've got a few for Dan, but I'm just in the interest of sharing it around, I'm going to go to Josh. Um, for a multifaceted risk, how do you determine the risk owner? That's a really good question. And it goes to, I think, what Sarah was speaking about in relation to our framework. Um, and the framework touches on predominantly, it's predominantly internally focused. However, because of the ability that MTIA have in the important role in driving the culture of the delivery of our program overall, remember there's, there's, there's many thousands of people out there on site delivering the projects. The tone is set from MTIA as the client in relation to these projects. So in terms of the risk, I would say it's a collective risk. Um, we've got a really important part to play in setting the tone, setting that culture, setting the expectations around um, how important it is to minimise opportunities for fraud and corruption and, and behave in, in the most, uh, the, the most uh, integrity fulsome way. Um, but then that's, it's important that that flows through to the other parties as well who are involved in delivery. So overall, a collective risk we need to do and play a really important role as part of that. We need to make sure that those messages are adopted by our delivery partners as well. Mm, it's a complex one, but mm. thank you. Uh, so, Dan, back to you. Um, does IBAC participate in any international networks and activities on this topic? And if we do, um, which um, forums are they? I guess our, our primary forums that we uh, interact with probably are the interstate ones. Uh, we have regular contact with our colleagues interstate. Uh, internationally, we do make it a point to scan the horizon regularly. Um, we obviously had contact with um, um, UK agencies before. Um, they've had good had visits here as well. I wouldn't highlight any for this particular example. We did do a scan of, of international um, academic publications, but probably would highlight OECD. We're very well aware of their frameworks. Uh, the UN Transparency International, we've had uh, latest um, with before. I think anything that would come up, we would, we would leap at the opportunity to interact, but nothing regular that comes to mind. Um, but we're, we're just constantly doing yeah. environmental scanning. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you don't mind, then I'd like to say we um, at MTIA we've we've spent a bit of time talking to our counterparts interstate. So I have regular meetings with Transport for New South Wales head of Assurance and Integrity, and also with the Queensland um, Department of Transport mm -hmm. as well. Um, and to be honest with you, it's interesting. The risks are, are pretty similar across across the jurisdictions um, and you know as you we everybody's where we are all doing very significant project work um, so it's a really good um, opportunity for us to sort of um, leverage and just share ideas and share what what their experience as well so I do think um, you know we really think that's a really important part of what we do as well your yeah, network it's very yep. important yeah yeah thank you uh, Tom we have one for you um, how do you ensure stakeholders adhere to policies they know about, however, they look for loop holes and look to brush off the severity of what they're seeing. I think that comes back to the culture that we said. We don't accept poor outcomes, we don't accept poor behaviours, and it does come from a leadership um, tone setting. Um, people will always look for ways around the rules and it's important that they understand that that's not the way we work. So we really do set a high standard in the way we do our work as well as what we do. Um, I think that's the best way of um, demonstrating the behaviours we expect from our people and our contractors. And I think, as, as Tom also said, we do have a very strong assurance around our projects, whether it's from within MTIA or whether it's broadly within the central agencies as well. Um, and I think that's really important. And just, again, sort of making people know that we are, gonna, we are going to sort of, you know, confirm whether they are complying with the requirements or not, and that they understand that it's a very important part of their responsibility as a, as a sort of a, a member of MTIA sort of family. Thank you. Uh, this is an interesting one um, for either Dan or Sarah or anybody else who'd like to take it. But do corruption risks in major projects translate to national security risks? Can get the ball rolling. It'd be interesting to see uh, MTIA's comments. I think, in terms of undue influence, that could be an interesting field because obviously we're dealing with contractors that have um, large networks overseas, and I think the whole idea of um, undue influence coming from abroad is not outlandish at all. I uh, would certainly take sources from anywhere um, as it pertains to the Victorian public sector and 
infrastructure projects. So you potentially, uh, obviously it's beyond our purview, we would hand those issues regarding international security to the appropriate agencies. Um, but in terms of public sector delivery um, and the use of public money in Victoria, yeah, the international sources are of interest. I think that's right, Dan. I, uh, um, I agree. I think it's just important to note in the MTIA context as well, these projects are um, so large and so complex and they do involve um, international parties as well, um, where they're directly from international, have Australian-based um, subsidiaries. So there is certainly a very um, sort of complex array of parties involved in the delivery of our projects. Um, and that's why having, I think, that all-encompassing framework, um, which we've spoken about today, which applies to all parties that we're involved with equally, um, is a you know a, a very strong way of um, sending that message to any parties that are involved um, that we've got strong um, expectations in relation to how integrity is managed. Thank you. A um, bit of a change of topic now. Um, one for Sarah. You mentioned the third party hotline. Um, could you talk to us a bit more about that and how it works? Um, it's run by a third party, uh, I think, uh, called Stopline. I think Stopline is actually quite um, actively used across government agencies. So there's a, a they, they offer a service whereby anybody can make a phone call, send an email or send a letter to the particular um, Stopline um, details. They um, take down all the relevant details and then they pass it on directly to myself and my director of integrity. And then that's when we sort of bring in the fraud and corruption control framework that we have. So we triage the, the complaint or the, or the allegation, and then we move to what we do with that, whether it's a full-blown investigation, whether it actually is a, an integrity matter. In some cases, um, you know, you may find that somebody sort of makes an allegation that somebody's been bullying them. And so on the face of it, that might seem HR, but then you have to sort of ascertain what the nature of the bullying is and why the bullying may have occurred. So it may be a straightforward HR matter. It may be a uh, bullying allegation because there's something that they don't want to do that's not necessarily appropriate. So we do that triage process after we get the allegation from stop line. Um, the individual or who may, makes the allegation can get information back from stop line as to what's progressed with their, with their complaint if they'd like that. And we certainly would do that if that was part of the 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 alleger's um, requirements but it, look it's well it's well it's well used across government um, and it's a pretty it's a pretty good service um, so we're very happy to, to have it as part of our um, our, our fra framework mm. and Sarah might be worth mentioning as well how we publicize and make people aware of the availability of yep. a stop line through the website um, through putting posters up around our offices site-based communications as well to make sure there's a really broad understanding across um, the delivery of our projects that this is an avenue which is available. And by that mean, Josh means that our contractors at the site offices can use the stop line. They don't, it doesn't have to be just MTI, MTIA employees. Yeah, no, that's um, an interesting point. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, I've got another question here for anybody who wants to take it. Um, is decision making um, exposed to a risk assessment process as well? And if yes, how does this work to detect covert um, collusion? I'm happy to, to, yeah. to answer. I, I yeah. think, um, yes, decision-making is subject to um, an assessment of the risk that's involved in that process. And um, it goes to the point that I was making earlier about the, the governance structures which are in place um, to oversee and manage the evaluation processes that we go through. So um, at a high level, that involves multiple levels of oversight in relation to decisions that are being made. So we have our evaluation teams, all of whom are required to sign um, declarations of um, private interests. Um, we have a review team, which then reviews the material that's come to them. And we have our external or higher governance approvals through our Director General and through government as well. Point being, um, I think a key point being that it's not within the purview of any one individual to make decisions. These are decisions um, that are made based on a whole lot of people's input. Um, but importantly as well, under the oversight of probity. So we have probity advisor um, who's there to answer any questions or concerns that might arise as well as probity auditor who does an extra layer 
um, of um, overseeing the process and make sure that everything that we've said that we're going to comply with from an evaluation point of view um, is being adhered to. And the sign-offs that we get from our probity advisor and our probity auditor at the end of the process are really critical um, towards giving us comfort that the governance processes that have been and that have been documented and that we've followed have been um, have been appropriately adhered to. Thank you. Uh, so we have another one here about supply chain risk management frameworks and whether there are any available that would detect foreign influence in program sponsorship and management. And the question is particularly focused on cybersecurity vulnerabilities. Mm. Well, we can skip it and I'll Second give you some thinking notice. time. I'll mm. give you some thinking time. Um, if for just one address to each of you, if there's one critical thing, one takeaway that you'd like it, us to take from today's session, what would it be? I think I'd go for, in terms of being prepared to speak up if people feel they need to. Uh, it's a safe environment. We've got the services and the support to provide that anonymous reporting um, because concerns are taken seriously. Thank you. For me, and we've mentioned it many times already today, but it's the culture and setting the tone from the top. Um, we've uh, really got, as, as Tom mentioned, we're really fortunate to have um, senior management within MTIA, and this translates through to our construction partners as well, um, but are very focused on this. And when you get that tone set from the top, it makes a massive difference to those that are on the ground delivering the projects. Okay. Um, I suppose uh, if I go back to the private interest issue, I think, um, you know, we, we really need staff to understand their obligations in relation to declaring those. If in doubt, asking the question, oh, I've got this, does it impact what I'm trying to do or what I need to do? And I think, uh, again, the culture pieces are, you know, the senior management group are very, very keen to, to get staff to understand their obligations. But I think the conflict of interest piece is a really, really important part of everything we do. Because if, if something goes wrong along the, the journey, then we're called out. And, and I think that's, that's a really bad look for the MTIA. Thanks. Dan, anything you'd like to add? Oh, look, I think firstly, it's, and we've talked at length about the culture um, in the public sector, maybe it's in private sector culture, those that work with us. I think that can't be understated, um, certainly in terms of the, the frameworks that have been presented here that have been you know, quite robust, but nothing's foolproof. Uh, and it is an ongoing task to get to know our own internal cultures um, and to make them as safe as, as possible to enable the supply where that needs to happen. So I think understanding your context is just primordial. You just, you have a, a fluid workforce, it's changing all the time, people are changing sectors. Uh, with your old timers, you, you need to leverage their influence and knowledge, um, but you also need to be aware that new people will come all the time, they need to be onboarded very well, robustly. Um, we need to draw on lessons that have been learned internally to share that externally towards the broader public se sector. All those things are important to not only uh, know your culture, but to uh, to track it as it morphs and develops over time. Thank you. Um, just such a big emphasis on culture. I can't tell you how often we hear it yet. Thank you. And um, thank you again, all of you, for your time today. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. So, yes, a big thanks to Dan, Sarah, Josh and Tom. Um, and uh, to all our organisers um, for your contribution to organising this webinar today and making it happen. And just before we wrap up, um, a couple of last minute comments from me. We will send you the links to the resources that were mentioned today throughout the session to the report and to other resources um, and a recording of today's webinar. So keep an eye out for that in your inbox. Also, to stay updated on the latest publications and information from IBAC, you can subscribe to our e-newsletter Insights or visit our website. We also regularly share updates on social media via Twitter, LinkedIn and YouTube, so check those out as well. 
And finally, as this webinar comes to an end and you exit the Zoom webinar, you will see a link to complete a short feedback survey. Um, we really do take this very seriously and I would really encourage you and ask you just to take a few minutes to fill it in for us. Um, we'd be very grateful and it helps us to plan um, future uh, webinars and to deliver the sort of information that is of interest. So we look forward to seeing you again um, at future IBAC events. Thanks again and bye for now.